Six weeks. Six weeks. Man, it seems like it's been such a long time ago. Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's have all come and gone. The tree's down. The, the decorations are put away. Six weeks ago, we were reading a story in the book of Acts about a man named Paul, a story that we go back to this morning. Paul has been taken prisoner and after several trials failed to, to find any guilt in him or any, any, anything that they could even charge him with, the magistrates and even the king of the Jews are suggesting that, well, maybe he should be freed. But the problem is if he's released, the crowds will riot and they will kill him. So Paul plays the citizenship card and he claims the Roman right. He appeals his case to be heard by Caesar. And now he's being shipped back to Rome. And even though he's a prisoner, he's become friends with the guard, the centurion that's guarding him, and the boat captain who's taking him on this journey back to Rome. And as a result of this friendship, Paul gets, well, he gets special treatment that most prisoners don't normally get. He's allowed to go ashore and spend some time with some friends on just a promise that he would be back at the boat when they got ready to leave. He's allowed to go up on the upper deck when normally prisoners are held below in a, in a very dark holding cell, a box. And as he's standing up on the deck, he sees Tarsus go by. It's the city he grew up in. He'd always dreamed he would one day return home, but he never in his wildest imaginations thought he would be returning in chains. And so he watches in silence as his hometown and, and the coastline that he loved as a boy goes by and fades out of distance. And, and some point later, the seas begin to get rough and turbulent. The winds are kicking up and a, and a storm is about to unleash its strength and its fury on this ship and this crew. Now, normally, this would only be about a two-week journey starting over here, over here at the island, the, uh, at, at, Ces at the city of Caesarea. Normally, the voyage would go straight down the mouth of the Mediterranean and wind up through here to Rome, about a two-week journey. But this is mid-autumn, likely sometime in October, and the storms can rage throughout the Mediterranean. And in Acts 27, verse 4, Luke says, because we're going against the winds, we don't take this direct route. Instead, we start here and we hug the coastline. He says the weather's changing fast, and he writes they travel to the, the lee side of Cyprus. The lee side means the protected or the sheltered side. And they make their way over to here, the city of Myra. And in Myra, they board an Alexandrian ship. Now, this is no ship, no, no fishing vessel like they would have used on the Sea of Galilee. An Alexandrian ship was huge. It's one of the main ships that's used to take cargo in and out of Rome and deliver it to the rest of the world. And as we're going to find out later, not only is this, is this ship carrying a full load of grain, but it also has 276 passengers. And as they depart Myra, they make their way through the island of Rhodes down here towards Fairhaven and Lycia. And that's where we're going to pick up the story this morning as things are about to go from bad to worse. We're in Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 9. Acts 27, verse 9. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur, which falls typically in late September, early October. So, so we know about when this is occurring. So Paul warned them, Men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. Paul's saying, guys, I know these waters. I've been through here time and time again. Sailing right now, not a good idea. 
But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was a harbor in Crete facing both north, uh, southwest and northwest. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Isn't that a great line? The winds had let up a little bit, and they saw their opportunity. And so they sailed off to Phoenix. Now, now Phoenix is only about 40, maybe 45 miles away. So it would easily be a, a single day's journey. No problem. And Phoenix had a much better harbor to ride out the storm and wait for better waters. So the ship's pilot and the ship's owner and the guard, the Roman centurion, they all agree, we're going to go to Phoenix. They saw their opportunity. And they took it. Verse 14. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and, couldn't be, and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee side of a small island called Kauda, we were, barely, uh, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of, of Cyprus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of being saved. And after they'd gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Wait, wait. Isn't that good? Paul, a prisoner, is standing out on the deck. He's not even supposed to be up there in the first place. And he's like, he's like guys, guys, hey, uh, told you so. You should have listened to me. And I think, the Bible never tells us this, but I think right now every man on that boat wants to throw Paul over and lighten the load. But remember something. Paul has sailed these waters many times. He's come through this passage several times on his journeys before, and he knows what he's talking about. And so they're going to listen to him. And so Paul continues. Men, you should have listened, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and this loss. But now I urge you, keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God whom I belong to and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must circle, highlight, underline that. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. On the 14th night, did you hear that? The 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was only 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors set a lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. 
So the soldiers cut the rope. Notice that. The soldiers, not the sailors, the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you, take some food. You'll need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God in front of them all. And he broke it and he began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. Altogether, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. What a story. What a story. This is just getting good. This, this, this massive storm has hit them, and suddenly, man, everything's out of control. It is chaos. It is panic. They are freaking out. And isn't that exactly what happens to us in life sometimes? We get hit with a storm or even, even a series of storms, and we're totally out of control. Our lives, our finances, our relationships, our health, a single storm or many storms hitting us all at once. And, 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 it, and it just, man, our, our life is like a drift all of a sudden. And so real quick, I want to stop and I want to give you three things that storms can create for our lives. The first one is simply this. The storms of life can cause us to drift from our goals and our values. The storms of life could cause us to, to, to drift away from our goals and our values. It's been 14 days. This ship is drifting out in the middle of the Mediterranean. 14 days, they're trying to find anything that looks like a way out. We lost our compass. We lost our navigation system. That, that, that little line there in verse 20, did you catch it when we read it? It simply said that the storm continued raging and we finally gave up all hope of being saved. There was neither sun nor stars that appeared for many days. Is that just, is that just literary freedom? Is, is Luke saying, oh, it was so dark we couldn't see the sun or the stars? No, Luke is saying we lost our GPS. Man, Google Voice wasn't working. My cell phone wasn't working. There was no GPS. We had no way of navigating because that's the way you navigated back then. In the daytime, you'd see a sunrise or a sunset, so you knew east and you knew west. And if you're a, night, if you're a sailor, at nighttime, you know the constellations and you know how to navigate. You can sail even at night. But these guys, for 14 days... They don't have a compass. They don't have a navigation system. For 14 days, they have no idea. Are we being pushed north? Are we going south towards Africa? Are we blown, being blown all the way back to the other side of the Mediterranean? For 14 days, they're clueless, drifting along and just getting hammered by this storm, not knowing where they are, not knowing where they're heading. And sometimes I wonder in our lives if we're not the same way. Man, it's easy to lose sight of our goals and our values when we're in the right, when we're in the midst of a storm. Am I going the right direction? I don't know. Am I, am I still about what I'm supposed to be about? I don't know. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when we get into storms, especially bad ones, man, we'll, we'll grab onto anything. We're desperate to find a way out and, and, and our goals and our direction and, and, and man, those things, they, they'll take a back seat because right now what's going on is lots more important and we have other things to focus on. I'm just trying to grab on something to float, something that'll get me out of this mess. And that leads to number two, the storms of life can cause us to throw out what's the most valuable to us. 
the storms of life can cause us to throw out what's most valuable. In Luke 19, in verse 19, Luke says the, the ship's crew started throwing overboard the ship's tackle. And you think, okay, that no big deal. They're, they're fishermen. So they're going to have fishing poles and they're going to have nets. No, 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 no. This is a totally different term. You see, the tackle of a huge cargo ship isn't fishing poles and nets. The tackle is spare sails and spare joists and pulleys and spare ropes and everything that you need and the spare parts that can break down on this ship. That's what the tackle is. These huge ships would carry these spares so when something breaks, when a, when a sail rips, you've got a replacement. And all that tackle, everything, is thrown overboard. And they start throwing all the supplies overboard. Anything that's not nailed down, overboard it goes. And eventually they have to throw the cargo, the grain, overboard. That grain was going to pay for this trip. And now it's sitting at the bottom of the sea. When we hit a storm of life, don't we sometimes throw out what's the most important? Man, when we get rocked in life, what's the first place we look at? It's ourselves. We, we're going to focus on the problem. What do I need to do to fix it? What are you going to do to get out of it? But do you hear, do you hear how us-centered that sounds? We lose sight of what's important. That old, that old self-preservation kicks in. And our only priority, our only concern is, how am I going to get out of this mess? i got to find a way to, i, I got to go. I gotta, but, but wait, look at who you are. You're a child of God. We tend to abandon ship when things get rough. We tend to abandon our faith when things get rough. We're impatient. And, and, and we're going to start sacrificing policies and, and convictions we do that financially. I have a conviction, a, a, a financial conviction about my tithing. I want to give X amount to God every month. But then, then you get laid off from work or the bills mount up or a sudden unexpected something happens and all of a sudden my tithing goes out the window because you know what? This is about self-preservation right now. And when we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, it's easy to lose our faith. And before you know it, we throw out what's valuable to us. And when that happens, number three, those storms are going to lead to despair. Those storms are going to cause us to despair. We, we see this even with the most dedicated followers of Jesus. I mean, we've got almost this exact same story, right? About 30 years earlier with Jesus and the disciples. And they're out on the Sea of Galilee and things are going crazy and the winds are blowing the ship and, and they are freaking out. Seasoned, seasoned sailors and vet, fishermen and they're freaking out. They wake up Jesus screaming, aren't you afraid we're going to die? Notice they didn't, ask, they didn't ask Jesus to do something. They didn't ask Jesus, they didn't say, Lord, we have faith in you. They didn't even ask Jesus, would you teach us how to sleep on a boat in the middle of a storm? Because you're pretty good at that. No, they're freaking out. They said, Lord, we're going to die. You see, these storms could cause terror in our lives. It could cause despair even when we're in the boat with Jesus. And the moment we take our eyes off of who we are with, the moment we forget whose we are, I promise you, despair is going to set in. This cargo ship is filled with experienced crewmen. And they all think they're going to die. And so what happens? They start getting near land, and, and they throw down the anchors overboard to, to, to slow them down. See, the, the idea is it, it's going to slow them down so that they won't hit the shore too hard. 
And in the midst of all this chaos and this despair and this panic, this prisoner stands up on deck, who isn't even supposed to be up there in the first place, and he says, men, I tried to tell you, but let me tell you now, God is with me. Let me tell you about what God said about where I'm going, and let me tell you what God told me about you. You haven't eaten in 14 days. I mean, how could you eat when you're on a boat that's rocking back and forth? There's no way you to, to eat. And, and so Paul, Paul breaks bread, and he gives thanks in front of all of them. And he said, eat. And they were strengthened. And they were encouraged. Man, how do we do that? How do we do that in our life? What do we anchor on to? In our finances? In our relationships? With our health? With, with everything in our country right now? With all the social issues going on? In the midst of the storm that is our nation today, what are you anchored to? And Paul gives these sailors three things, three anchors that brings them hope and courage. And these are the same three anchors we need today. Number one, God's presence. God's presence. Do you notice Paul's not freaking out on this ship? He's the only one that isn't concerned and, and going ballistic right now aboard this boat. Why? Because he knows who he is, and he knows who he belongs to. And the presence and the nearness of God is the absolute first anger we have got to have. Paul's faith came through. In spite of all that was going around him, in spite of the situation, in spite of the storm, in spite of the panic, in spite of the circumstances, Paul goes, look, I know who I am. And I know who was with me last night. And I know who's with me right now. And the best illustration I can come up with is simply this. It's like getting a gym membership. It's like getting a membership to that, that local fitness club. And, and because you have that, that membership card in your wallet, you're expecting you're going to lose weight. And it doesn't work like that. Because it's not about having a card that says you're a member. That doesn't have anything to do with your fitness. You have to go to the gym and use the equipment. Christianity isn't a card. And even the fact that you once said a prayer that says, hey, I'm a card-carrying Christian, so I'm in. No. It's the presence of God in your life that has to be an anchor. God's presence is what's going to keep us anchored in the storm. And His presence will bring us to the second anchor, God's purpose. Listen, I don't know. I don't know what storm you might be facing right now. I don't know your financial struggles. I don't know your health issues. I don't know your job issues. I don't know what's rocking your world right now. But in the midst of the storm, no matter what storm it is, we need to remind ourselves, I know what I'm about. This storm is not what I'm about. This storm will not define me. This wandering... This being adrift right now, this aimlessness, it's not who I am. My finances, my health, my relationships, my struggles, it does not define who I am. I have the presence of God in my life each and every day. And because of that, I know my purpose. And Paul in the midst of a storm, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of everybody around him, panicking he says hey I can encourage this crew even as a prisoner on my way back to Rome to stand trial I can give thanks to God and break bread my faith and what I know about God will change that storm my faith and what I know about God will change the strength of the wind and the size of those waves 
But first, I have to be anchored in His presence and in His purpose. Because only then can I be anchored in number three, God's promise. God's promise. Now, I know on your worksheets, that's the last of the fill in the blanks. And so you're already thinking, okay, it's time to get ready to go now. But I want you to stop a minute. I want you to put down your pens and pencils, and I, want, I, really, I really, really want you to listen to me. I just, I just want you to stop and look up at me and listen for just a couple of minutes because there's a question we have to ask ourselves, especially when things are really, really, really hard. When we're struggling, when we're worried, when we're feeling lost and we're feeling alone, <clears throat> man, we've got to stop and ask ourselves one simple question. Do I believe in God? Or do I believe God? Do I believe in God? Or do I believe God? You see, that I in makes a huge difference. Am I someone who goes, yeah, I believe in God. I believe there is a God. Or am I someone that truly believes God? If God says, this is who I am, this is my purpose, do I believe it? When the storms and the struggles of life hit me right between the eyes, do I put my trust in the size of the God that holds me in the palm of His hand? Do I believe in God or do I believe God? Because if I believe God, I will not fear that storm, no matter how big it is. My God is bigger. Not that I want the storm. Not that I enjoy the storm. But I will not fear it. Do I believe in God? Or do I believe God? Because if I believe God, I will not lose my way. I may not have any visual references. I may get blown around and tossed about. But I know God's Word tells me He's with me, and I believe it. Do I believe in God? Or do I believe God? Because if I believe God, I'm not going to lose my priorities. I'm not worrying about self-preservation because I know it's in His hands. I know who this God is. And I don't just believe in God. I believe God and His promises. And I trust that He meant them. Are you anchored in this God who cannot and will not ever take His eyes off of you? Do you know His presence? Do you know His purpose? Do you know His promises that He has for your life? Storms aren't fun. Being adrift isn't fun, but we don't have to lose our hope. We don't have to lose what's most valuable and important to us. We don't have to turn to despair, not when we know His purpose, not when we know His promises. And oh yeah, the rest of the story, what happens to Paul and the crew and the passengers, well, you can read it for yourself, but the ship breaks up on the rocks and everyone swims to, to shore, all 276 people make it safely to that little island. And what happens on that island? Come back next week. Let's pray. Father, thanks for who you are. Thanks for being a God that loves us. God, we want you to take the storms in our lives away. We want you to calm those winds and, and, and the waves. We want you to give us smooth sailing. But we also understand that's fiction, that's not life. Father, will you calm us in the midst of the storm? May you anchor us to you in the midst of this storm. Help us to take our eyes off of whatever's coming against us 
And may we set our eyes on you, our hope and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here. Please come back next Sunday. In the meantime, man, there's a lot of people out there facing storms of their own. And those storms just might be intense. They may be ready to give up all hope of ever being saved because they're focusing on the storm and the wind and the waves. But God sends you to pray with them, to be there for them, to remind them that they're loved. And while you're at it, invite them to come to church with you next Sunday. God bless you.